Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Shah. India is now home to the world's fourth largest stock market. It has beaten Hong Kong to take this spot. The lead is slim, but the trend is steady. Despite today's volatility, investor confidence in India's growth story has been growing. We look at the numbers, also why Hong Kong is slipping and what Beijing is doing to steady the ship. We'll also discuss the stock that lost big on the Lal Street today. Z took a beating after its deal with Sony failed. We look at the full story and the implications. In West Asia, the Red Sea crisis is escalating. The US and the UK have launched their eighth attack on Houthis in the last 11 days. In Israel, protesters storm the parliament and Netanyahu is proposing a two-month-long ceasefire deal with Gaza. A Chinese spy ship is heading to the Maldives. How should India see this? A Biden deepfake is doing the rounds in America. What does this trend mean for elections across the world? India's foreign minister is in Africa. Why it makes sense for New Delhi to bet on Africa's growth? Why Canada is limiting the number of foreign students it will take? Does Putin want Alaska back? Will it trigger another war? Why is the Philippines defying the International Criminal Court? And why the world is loving pre-loved fashion? A special report on the booming second-hand market. The headlines first. Israel suffers its deadliest day since the ground offensive began in Gaza. On Monday, 24 soldiers were killed. Israeli army says they have encircled the city of Khan Yunus. In recent weeks, the densely populated city in South Gaza has been the epicenter of fighting. Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi to visit Turkey on Wednesday. His talks with President Erdogan will focus on the Israel-Hamas war. Raisi's visit has been postponed twice. It comes amid fears of the conflict escalating in West Asia. Islamic politics over the Ram Temple pick space after Pakistan, the organization of Islamic Cooperation, OIC, slams the inauguration of the Ayodhya Temple. The OIC has 57 members, with 48 being Muslim-majority countries. They've issued a statement expressing, quote-unquote, grave worry over yesterday's event. Elon Musk backs India's bid for a permanent seat at the United Nations Security Council, says it's absurd that the world's most populous country doesn't have one. Only the US, the UK, Russia, France and China are permanent members. India has been leading the push for Security Council reform. In Myanmar, six high-ranking junta officers have been taken into custody. They surrendered a strategic town and hundreds of troops to the rebels. The junta lost the town near China's border earlier this month. Under Myanmar's military law, deserting a post can be punished by death. Hungary's Viktor Orban invites his Swedish counterpart to Budapest. Prime Minister Orban wants to discuss the Nordic country's bid to join NATO. Sweden still needs Hungary and Turkey's approval. This week, Turkey's parliament is expected to vote on Stockholm's bid. And Sri Lanka debates a controversial social media bill. The online safety bill makes companies criminally liable for harmful posts. It would also make anonymous or parody social media accounts illegal. The opposition says this bill is draconian. It could be passed as early as this week. Our lead story tonight is about global markets. They're witnessing a tug of war. India's Dalal Street versus Hong Kong Hang Seng. They're going head to head. And what's the price? The title of the world's fourth largest stock market. That's what they're fighting for. The biggest market is the US, followed by China and Japan. And today, India took the fourth spot. It went past Hong Kong. It was a fantastic start to the day, to what turned out to be a roller coaster of a day. If you're an investor, you know what I'm talking about. And you have our sympathies. It was a rough day, yes. Indian markets saw a lot of volatility. The day's trade opened in the green but ended in the red. The Sensex crashed by over 1,000 points, the Nifty by over 300. And Hong Kong saw the opposite today. Since last week, it has been falling. But today, Beijing promised an intervention. So the Hong Kong stock market, the Hang Seng, gained almost 3%. Although this may not last. 
Officials in Hong Kong remain nervous, so much so that they made a rare admission today. It came from this man, John Lee, the chief executive of Hong Kong. He's not optimistic about the markets. I must say that market sentiment is rather sensitive these days. So I hope that everyone will closely monitor the markets and act with caution. Government departments will closely monitor changes in the markets. The market sentiment is sensitive in Hong Kong, he says. In India, that's not the case, though. The Indian stock market is leveling up. Like I said, it has beaten Hong Kong. India's Dalal Street is bigger than Hong Kong's. And this is an important milestone for India and Indian corporates. This is also a reflection on Hong Kong. It used to be Asia's biggest financial hub. But that's not the case anymore. India is poised to replace them. Despite today's correction, major investors remain bullish on India. Look at the global rankings. These are the world's biggest stock markets. The United States sits at the top. It is worth over $50 trillion, $50 trillion, followed by China. These are stocks listed in the mainland. They're worth $8.4 trillion. At number three is Japan with $6.63 trillion. And India now ranks number four. Hong Kong has slipped to number five. India's markets are worth $4.33 trillion. Hong Kong is at $4.29 trillion. It's not a small difference. It, it is a small difference, rather. But in the coming days, it's expected to widen. Because the mood is changing. Global investors are making long-term bets. I'll give you an example. Major sovereign wealth funds and public pension schemes are picking India over China. Last year, a think tank conducted a survey. It reached out to 100 funds. Their assets are worth $26 trillion. And they were asked where they would like to invest. Most of them picked India. Then came Brazil and China. Around 40 funds had a positive outlook for India. In 2023, overseas funds make bi made big investments. They poured $20 billion into Indian stocks. So what is attracting them to India? Steady growth. That's what we've seen in the past eight years. Indian stock markets have delivered gains and profits for eight straight years. Indian corporates have grown on the back of steady economic policies, policy reforms, and a largely stable political environment. All of this has made India the growth engine for the world. And those are not my words. This is the assessment of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. The IMF says India, and I'm quoting, is a star performer. The momentum is expected to continue in 2024. This is the IMF projection. It expects India to be a top performer this year as well and to account for more than 16% of global growth. And there is no doubt, when India grows, Indian corporates will benefit too, which explains the bullish outlook. Plus, there's one more factor, the decline of Hong Kong. It makes India a more appealing option. Hong Kong stocks are depreciating. There is a rapid decline. We talked about this yesterday too. The Hang Seng seesawed today. The index closed in the green rising almost 3%, but over the past five days, it has plunged by more than 400 points. And Beijing is trying to steady it. The Chinese Premier spoke about this today. His name is Li Chiang, and he's unhappy. He wants the Hong Kong market to stabilize. Today, he called for, quote-unquote, forceful measures. There is talk of a stimulus package. Reports say Beijing is preparing this package worth around $278 billion. The money will be used to, to make investments to stabilize the overall market. So India may have gotten ahead, but it cannot rest on its laurels because China is fighting back. And staying with Indian markets, one share is clearly bucking the trend here, and that's Z Entertainment. It's on a race to the bottom. Those from India will know about this company. It's a media conglomerate. It operates television channels, streaming platforms, and also production houses. But right now, it is in crisis. Just look at the numbers. On Friday, Z shares were flying high, almost 244 rupees per share. 244 rupees per share, that was on Friday. And now it is down to 160 rupees. Z Entertainment dropped 31% in one trading day. How did that happen? Because a multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar merger, in fact, was called off. 
It all started in 2021. Z and Sony announced a big move. As you know, Sony is a global media giant. The company is headquartered in Japan. Their Indian arm decided to merge with Z. It was very big news. Both companies have a sizable presence in India, so together they had immense potential. The merger was valued at $10 billion. But on Monday, Sony scrapped it. They said, no deal. Now, the obvious question is, what happened? Sony's official statement says a couple of things. A, merger conditions had not been met, meaning Sony was not happy with what was on the table. And B, time ran out. They had to close the deal by January 21st, but that date came and went. So Sony decided it was time to walk away. Turns out they're also suing Z Entertainment. And what's the claim? Almost $90 million in damages. That's what Sony wants. Sony says Z violated the merger terms. Of course, Z denies this. They have hinted at legal action of their own. Now, this much is in the public domain. But what was happening behind the scenes? A leadership tussle. That's essentially what brought down this deal. Let me explain. There's a big question after every merger. Who will lead the new business entity? Here, the first plan was to appoint Puneet Goenka. He's the managing director and CEO of Z, also the son of company patriarch Subhash Chandra. But last year, a bombshell dropped. India's market regulator SEBI began investigating the father-son duo. They suspected misuse of company funds. Basically, money was being siphoned off. And how much money are we talking about? Initial reports mentioned some 200 crore rupees. But the new number is much higher, anywhere between 800 to 1,000 crore rupees. That's $120 million. So last year, SEBI cracked down. It said Puneet Goenka cannot lead any listed company. That ban was later rever reversed. But Sony had seen enough. They wanted someone else to lead the merged entity, someone without baggage which is why the merger talks broke down. Z did propose some alternatives, but Sony did not like any of them. And that brings us to present day. What does this falling out mean for the Indian media landscape? Let's look at some numbers. Sony has 31 channels in India. Z is set to have around 45. Both companies also have their own streaming platform, Z5 and Sony Live. Sony Live has around 12 million subscribers. Z5 has around 7.5 million. So a merged entity would have been massive, essentially, especially in the current context. Most experts agree that streaming is the future. Its current market size is around $1.2 billion. By the end of this year, it could be $1.4 billion. And by the end of the decade, more than $3.6 billion. So there's a lot of money to be made which was the whole idea behind this deal. If the merger went through, a major cash infusion would have happened. A new entity would have had $1.5 billion in the bank. Imagine what you could do with it. New and improved content, better interface, more live sports events. All of that could have been possible. Other companies have also realized this potential, like Disney Hotstar and Viacom 18. Hotstar is the market leader in India. They have more than 42 million subscribers. Viacom 18 owns Geo Cinema. They own the media rights of the Indian Premier League, the IPL, also the Indian cricket team's bilateral matches. So the merger makes sense. You have entertainment on one side and sports on the other. Sony and Z also had similar plans to completely revamp their businesses, to challenge the big boys of OTT. So it's clearly a setback for the Indian media space. More for Z5. They clearly needed an extra boost to find their mojo. I guess they'll have to keep waiting now. It's also a bad look for India Inc. We keep talking about greater synergy, about foreign firms working with Indian ones. But for that, we need higher standards. You can't have promoters cooking books and siphoning money. You need transparency. You need good corporate practices. Unfortunately, Z Entertainment seems to have failed that test. We can't afford more of these. We need global businesses to respect Indian firms. But as they say, respect is earned. So that was a lot of business news. Let's shift to geopolitics now. There's more escalation in the Red Sea. The US and the UK have carried out airstrikes on Yemen on the Houthi rebels. This was the eighth round of airstrikes. Both missiles and fighter jets were used. US officials say around 25 to 30 bombs were dropped. 
And how many targets were hit? Around eight. Some of them were underground, storage sites. Others were missile and surveillance bases. So the coalition took them out. They released some footage of this operation. Take a look at this. So what's the plan here? From the looks of it, to keep bombing Yemen. The first coalition airstrike was on the 11th of this month, 11th January. In the next 10 days, we've seen seven more attacks. So a total of eight strikes in less than two weeks. And chances are we'll see more because the UK has issued a clear warning to the Houthis. Listen to this. These attacks are illegal, they're unacceptable. And what we've done, again, is send the clearest possible message that we will continue to degrade their ability to carry out these attacks whilst sending the clearest possible message that we back our words and our warnings with action. More attacks. That's what the US and the UK are betting on. But will that be enough? Perhaps not. I'll give you two reasons why. Number one, the Houthis do not seem scared. They have launched 12 attacks in the last 10 days, meaning after the airstrikes. Even this time, they have promised revenge. And number two, the Western coalition is divided. Their latest airstrike was backed by six countries. The US, the UK, Australia, Bahrain, Canada, and the Netherlands. No France, no Germany, no Italy, and no major Arab states. So it's not really a global response. It's more of an Anglo-American response. And Washington realizes this. Last week, Joe Biden was asked about the airstrikes on Yemen. He was asked, are they working? Look at his response. Are the airstrikes in Yemen working? Well, when you say working, are they stopping the Houthis? No. Are they going to continue? Yes. Are they working? No. Will they continue? Yes. That was Biden's response. The truth is, only two things will stop the Houthis. A major Western onslaught or an end to the war in Gaza. Which brings us to the battlefield in Gaza. Is there any sign of that war ending? Well, Israel has reportedly proposed a new deal, a two-month-long ceasefire. The deal has three major points. One, the release of all hostages. Hamas is still holding around 130 people in Gaza. Israel wants all of them released. Two, some Palestinian prisoners will be freed. The exact number is not clear. And three, a new war strategy. Israel will redeploy its forces inside Gaza. No more carpet bombing. Instead, Israel will shift to precision tactics. That is the proposal. It's been relayed to Hamas via Egypt and Qatar. They're still waiting for a response. On paper, it's much better than previous proposals because two months can change a lot. Much needed aid can enter Gaza. Hospitals and shelters can be restocked. Also, more diplomacy can happen. So maybe the Hamas will agree. But what explains Israel's sudden change of heart? Why do they want a ceasefire? For starters, the military campaign is dragging on, so the casualties are rising. Monday, like we told you, was the worst day for Israeli soldiers. 24 of them were killed in Gaza, out of which 21 died in the same explosion. What's worse, it was probably an Israeli mine that killed them, their own soldiers. So naturally, people are worried. Israel has lost more than 200 soldiers in Gaza. If the war drags on, the toll may rise. So maybe Benjamin Netanyahu wants a reset to regroup and refocus. Plus, there's a lot of political pressure. Like I mentioned, 130 hostages are still in Gaza. Their families are livid with Israel's government. On Monday, some of them stormed an official meeting. A parliamentary committee session was underway. Look at what happened next. There's pressure from outside too. Netanyahu recently rejected the two-state solution. He said no to a Palestinian state. So Western countries are not happy with him. They feel his plan is not working. 
Palestinians deserve a sovereign state. Unless you pursue a, a two-state solution, I really don't see that there is another solution. Certainly, the way you're trying to destroy Hamas is not the way they're doing, because they are seeding the hate for generations. We don't want to see hospitals as war zones. We don't want to see hospitals as uh, uh, battle battlefields. Um, they should be as protected as possible. So it's Netanyahu versus everyone. Maybe that's why he called for a timeout, to reassess his plans. But whatever the reason, the people of Gaza need it. After 109 days of fighting, two months of peace is priceless. Tell that to the Maldives. Their president is spoiling for confrontation. First, he picked a fight with India, and now he's hosting Chinese research vessels, a.k.a. spy ships. It's now been confirmed by Mali. We've been hearing some chatter about such a vessel, but most of it was from open source data. Today, though, Mali came clean. The vessel in question is this one, the Xiang Yang Hong 03. Last we checked, it's near Indonesia. The ship is expected to reach Mali around the 8th of February. And what will it do there? Here's what the Maldivian government says. A request was made by China to make a port call for rotation of personnel and replenishment. The vessel would not be conducting any research while in Maldivian waters. That's the message from Mali. No research, just a port call. That's what they're saying. I guess we'll have to believe them. Having said that, two concerns still remain. One, why now? You've just picked a fight with India. You've asked Indian soldiers to leave your country and days later you host a Chinese vessel. Surely that's a message. And concern number two, such vessels often have dual use, meaning they can do a lot more than just research. Both India and the U.S. believe they can also spy, maybe snoop on Indian assets or gain information on Indian deployments. We can't rule it out because these ships have powerful surveillance gadgets and radars on board, which is why India has objected to such voyages. In 2019, New Delhi expelled a Chinese research ship from its EEZ. EEZ stands for Exclusive Economic Zone. Think of it as extended territorial waters. India also objected to such voyages in Sri Lanka. Since 2022, two Chinese spy ships had docked in Sri Lanka. New Delhi objected both times. Then last year, another request was made. A Chinese ship wanted to dock in January. This time, Sri Lanka said no. In fact, they banned all research voyages for one year. But can you guess the name of that ship, the ship that wanted to dock in Sri Lanka? Xiang Yang Hong 03, the same ship that is now heading to the Maldives. It was built back in 2016. It is registered in the port city of Shaman. The ship is around 100 meters long, 18 meters wide, and it can carry up to 4,800 tons. How is India reacting to this voyage? Reports say the Indian Navy is tracking the ship. It is well aware of the voyage. As for the political response, you can guess. India objected to the same ship docking in Sri Lanka, so the port call in Mali is no different. The question is, what happens next? I'm afraid it's a waiting game. Maybe there won't be any research or spying this time. But what about the next time? What if more voyages follow? That's what happened in Sri Lanka too. But in Colombo, the leadership was mature enough to strike a balance. After a point, they said no. Can the leadership in Mali do that? The indications are not good. Last month, the Maldivian government announced a big decision. They're cancelling a hydrography pact with India. It's basically a water survey agreement. India and the Maldives would jointly study the seabed. That was the pact. It was up for renewal this year, but President Mohamed Muizu has said he will not renew it. So do you see the message here? First, Mali cancels a survey pact with India, then a Chinese survey ship heads to the Maldives. So the concern is real. Whether it escalates or not is up to Mali. We talked about the maturity of leadership in Sri Lanka, but that maturity came at a cost. It took a raging political and economic crisis for Colombo to course correct, to realize the Chinese threat. Hopefully the Maldives will do better. It's election year in America and President Joe Biden is urging voters to not vote. Sounds bizarre? 
It's because it is. It began in the state of New Hampshire. This state has a Democratic primary lined up. That's where Democrats choose their presidential candidate. That's a primary where you choose the presidential candidate of your party in America. But just days ahead of this primary, people here started getting a strange call. It was a robocall, but the voice was that of Joe Biden. He was asking Democrats to not vote in the primary, asking them to save their votes for November, which is when the presidential election will take place. Let me read out an excerpt from this call. This is what it says. Voting this Tuesday only enables the Republicans in their quest to elect Donald Trump again. So why is Biden asking people not to vote? Well, that's the thing. It's not him. It's not Joe Biden. This was a deep fake call. It was technology sounding like Biden. It's a robocall for an upcoming election, 2024, obviously. So I just want to be careful in that comment. But that call was indeed uh, fake and not recorded by the president. I can confirm that. Uh, and so I just want to be really careful since it doesn't, uh, it is a primary election. It is a campaign. Don't want to speak too much uh, about that. Uh, and uh, look, more broadly, it, as we talk about deep fakes, uh, the president has been clear that there are risks associated with deep fakes. Uh, fake images and uh, misinformation can be exacerbated uh, by emerging technologies. Republicans deny any involvement we, in this. The Trump campaign says it was not them. But these calls went to almost 20,000 people. No one knows who was behind the calls. New Hampshire is investigating it now. And this episode has left experts and voters alarmed not just in America, but the world over. Because 2024 is the year of elections. Nearly 70 countries are going to polls. That's over half of the global population. So there will be a lot of elections, which means there will be a lot of fake news and possibly deep fakes. They can replicate a person's voice. They can replicate a person's appearance. You can make a deep fake, do and say whatever you want, pretty much. Then there's audio deep fakes. They're cheap, easy to edit, and extremely difficult to trace, which makes them even more dangerous. Because deep fakes can alter reality. They can influence voters, and by extension, influence election results. Just look at the survey from America. 81% voters say that deep fakes have impacted their decisions. 36% say deep fakes made them change their votes. 41% say they were misled by deep fakes. So it is a huge problem. In 2023, online deepfake videos surged by 550%. There were at least 500,000 audio and video deepfakes on social media platforms, and it's only growing this year. There's voice cloning, identity manipulation, AI produced fake news, manipulated images. You name it, and AI does it for you. In Bangladesh, deep fakes took over the internet ahead of elections. The ruling party, the opposition, no one was spared. And that's because, because of how cheap they are. You could make deep fakes for as little as $24 a month. In Taiwan, voters faced a flood of deep fakes. They targeted pro independence candidates. Most of them are believed to have come from China. In Pakistan, political parties themselves are using deepfakes. Imran Khan used an AI clone to address a rally. That's because he himself is in jail. And this is a big challenge for India too. It is the sixth most vulnerable country susceptible to deepfakes. The Prime Minister himself has spoken about this. Artificial intelligence ke karan, aur usme bhi deepfake ke karan jo ek naya sankat aa raha hai. भारत का बहुत बड़ा वर्ग ऐसा है कि उसके पास वेरिफिकेशन के लिए या ऑथेंटिफाई करने के लिए कोई उसके पास पैरेलल व्यवस्था नहीं है और बाइन लार्ज आजादी की लड़ाई से लेकर के भारत में जिस भी चीजें से मीडिया शब्द जुड़ता है उसकी एक इज्जत है और उसके कारण डीप फेक हो तो भी वो भरोसा कर लेता है यार ऐसे थोड़ा आया होगा कुछ तो होगा और ये बहुत बड़े संकट की तरफ जाएगा सब आज सो वॉट आर कंपनीज एंड कंट्रीज डूइंग अबाउट इट ओपन ए आई हैज टेकन स्टेप्स टू रिस्ट्रिक्ट द यूज ऑफ इट्स प्रोडक्ट्स इन पॉलिटिक्स फेसबुक एंड इंस्टाग्राम विल फ्लैग पोलिटिकल डीप फेक्स 
if political advertisers use AI in ads, they will be required to flag it on their platforms. So there are a few guardrails. But there are many more gaps. And deep fakes are distorting the truth. Politicians can say and do outrageous things, then call it AI generated and get away with it. So there is no accountability. Here's what governments need to do. Introduce and enforce regulation, provide deep fake identifiers, and limit or completely ban the use of AI in political campaigns. Here's what we as voters need to do. Be more vigilant. If something looks or sounds fishy, double check. Turn to traditional sources of news, not random reels or TikTok videos. And if you cannot verify something, do not hit forward. Because in 2024, it is not just power that is up for grabs, it is reality itself. Now let's focus on Africa as New Delhi is doing. Foreign Minister S.J. Shankar is visiting the continent, two countries specifically, Uganda and Nigeria. In Uganda, he attended the NAM Summit. NAM stands for the Non-Aligned Movement. India was among the founders of this group. This was during the Cold War years. India was, the idea was to not align with any camp, hence they were non-aligned. After the Cold War, the group struggled for relevance. And now the world is divided again in more than two camps. So what purpose does NAM serve? Here's what Minister Jayshankar said. A multipolar world with a reformed UN at its core is key. Economic decentralization with greater regional production is so as well. But we must press for cultural rebalancing where all heritage is mutually respected. A reformed United Nations and a multipolar world order. These goals stop India's diplomatic agenda. And guess who else wants the same? Africa, a continent of 54 countries chasing the same goals. This makes Africa an important partner for India. It is the second largest continent in the world. And in the current Western-led world order, Africa has been largely ignored. Not a single African country has a permanent seat at the United Nations Security Council. They do not get the representation they deserve. India is trying to change some of that. It has championed the cause of Africa. You saw that happen at the G20 summit. India was the president last year. And it pushed for the entry of the African Union, making the G20 the G21, group of 21 now, including the African Union. And now India is advocating for a reformed United Nations. It is talking about economic decentralization. Here's how Minister Jay Shankar made that pitch. While globalization has had many positive results, it has also undeniably led to very deep economic concentrations that much of the world today depends on production of a few geographies. Jay Shankar said this in Nigeria, his second stop on the Africa tour. He chose Nigeria to bring up globalization. He said the concept is being weaponized. Obviously, he was hinting at the ongoing conflicts, the wars in Ukraine and West Asia. They disrupt free trade, obstruct the movement of goods, and limit the freedom to travel. Overall, the world is left with fewer trade channels. Needless to say, this hurts the developing world more. Countries like India and Nigeria, where governments must support large populations. And globalization is the biggest casualty of conflict. But together, India and Africa can contain the damage by synergizing and expanding supply chains. New Delhi is making significant investments in Africa. Jay Shankar spoke about that too. We do see, uh, I mean, if today, uh, I would just say we, you know, if there are some big geopolitical bets that India is taking, one of the bets is on the rise of Africa. That we are betting that uh, in the next decade, we're going to see an amazing transformation here. India is betting on Africa's rise. It is opening doors for Indian corporates. They're being encouraged to invest in Africa, and the, and the progress has been stead steady. India is already among Africa's top five investors. So far, almost 200 projects have been completed. Another 65 are underway, and 81 are in the pipeline. India's trade with Africa is also rising. It has crossed $95 billion a year. India is offering concessional loans to African partners. So far, it has granted more than $12 billion. And there's potential for a lot more. 
because this is a relationship based on mutual interest and common goals, which is not to say there won't be challenges. There's a new scramble for Africa. China, Russia, the US, Europe, they're all looking to make the most of it. India cannot match their checkbooks. And India does not practice their military interventionism. So India must do what it does best. Build ties based on mutual respect, not get distracted by the other players, and play the long game. The big headline from Canada will impact students, foreign students. Canada has announced a new cap or limit to their entry. Intake will be cut by almost 35% and this is applicable for two years. They will allow fewer foreign students to enter Canada. Why? To ease the pressure on the country's housing market. Housing in Canada is becoming unaffordable and experts blame it on the spike in immigration. Last year, there were 1 million international students in Canada, out of which 37% were Indians. Now, the government plans to cut down their numbers. So how will this new cap work? And how will it impact Indian students? If you're planning to study in Canada, this next report is a must-watch for you. Canada is a top destination for foreign students. There's affordable education, a high quality of life, low cost of living and multiple job options. In 2023, there were over 1 million international students in Canada. But this year, the country has a different plan. It's capping the issue of student visas, almost by 35%. How will it work? The visa cap is a temporary one. It will last for two years. Canada can issue 364,000 student visas in 2024. Each province will be allocated a portion of that. This will be decided by two factors, the population of the area and the current student intake. Provinces will then decide how to divide them among colleges and universities. So what are the other new rules? Canada will also set a limit on postgraduate work permits. Earlier, it was easy to get them, which is why many students preferred Canada. It was a simple path to permanent residency. But now, Canada is capping issuing of work permits. It's to encourage students to return to their home countries. So who will be eligible for these permits? People pursuing masters or postdoctorate programs can get them, but it will now only be for three years. Also, spouses of international students are no longer eligible. So why is the government cracking down now? Like I said, Canada is a popular destination for students. But that's led to a housing crisis. More students means a shortage in apartments, and that has pushed up the rents. They have risen by 22% in the last two years. Home prices, too, are almost unaffordable. They are at an average of $550,000. So, rented apartments are hard to find. Housing prices have skyrocketed. And all of this is impacting Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's popularity. Canada is going to polls in 2025, which explains the cap that's happening right now. But how will this impact Canada's economy? Canada has always had an open immigration policy. It's to fill up job vacancies and replace the ageing workforce. Every year, international students contribute $16.4 billion to the economy. Canadian banks benefit from the influx of new students. That's because each student is required to have a GIC or Guaranteed Investment Certificate. This is an amount of more than 20,000 Canadian dollars. It's to cover their living expenses. Plus, it would impact the businesses, especially the restaurants and retail sector. Students make up for 4.6% of the 1.1 million workers in the food industry. Many businesses have already warned about shortages. Now, how will this impact Indians? Indians make up for 37% of all foreign students in Canada. Around 320,000 Indians already live here on student visas. A cap will obviously impact intake. Getting a visa will be much harder now. Many Indian students will lose out on opportunities. While this may help Canada preserve its resources, it will have an impact on its position as a top destination for students and drive them to go and study elsewhere. Now let's turn to Canada's western border. As Russian President Vladimir Putin has allegedly done, 
The rumor mills are ablaze. Putin is apparently eyeing his next prize. This time, he's supposedly going for an old Russian outpost, the U.S. state of Alaska. Yes, the rumors are that Putin wants Alaska back. Alaska was once a part of the Russian Empire, but Moscow sold the land back in 1867 to the still-fledgling country called the United States of America. This was before the great rivalry, before the Cold War, before the modern hostilities, and before anything of value had ever been discovered in Alaska. Russia had sold a frozen wasteland to the U.S. for the then princely sum of $7.2 million. But now reports say that Putin is unhappy and that he has declared the sale of Alaska, quote-unquote, illegal. But this is not true. It's an absurd rumor spread to either incite fear or just grab eyeballs. Either way, there's no truth to it. So why did these rumors begin? Because of a law that Putin signed a few days ago, he signed a decree on the 18th of January. Putin allocated some funds to Russia's Department of Foreign Property. These are to help find, register and give legal protection to Russian property abroad. It's basically about protecting Russian assets some of which are being held hostage by foreign governments. And this has been the case since Russia invaded Ukraine in 2022. So Putin's order is not really unusual. The Alaska rumors began because of the language of this decree. It mentioned protecting Russian property, including the property of the Soviet Union and the Russian Empire. The Soviet Union fell in December 1991. The Russian Empire lasted between 1721 and 1917. So someone thought Putin wants to claim everything that Russia ever owned from the 1700s till today. And that would include Alaska. This is how the rumor started. And they've even spread to the corridors of the White House. So let me just understand that he signed something today that said the sale of uh, Alaska is uh, illegitimate. Right. Well, I, I think I can I speak for all of us in the in the in the U.S. government to say that uh, certainly he is not getting it back. As if that exchange weren't ridiculous enough, Russia reacted to it. This is a tweet by Dmitry Medvedev. Putin's ally and former Russian president and prime minister, he says, and I'm quoting, according to a State Department representative, Russia is not getting back Alaska, which was sold to the U.S. in the 19th century. This is it then. And we've been waiting for it to be returned any day. Now, war is unavoidable. Please note the laughing emoji at the end. That should mean that World War III is not starting. Not over Alaska at any rate. But while the Russians have been laughing over the Alaska rumors, another historical claim, maybe no laughing matter. This is Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky making headlines, again over a decree about historical land. The decree is on the territories of the Russian Federation, historically inhabited by Ukrainians. He says these lands were once inhabited by Ukrainians, but they stayed with Russia after Ukraine became independent. Now, Zelensky does not want this land back. But he says crimes were committed against the people who lived there. He says Russia systematically destroyed their national identity, and Zelensky wants his country to cooperate with these ethnic Ukrainians in Russia. He wants to revive their Ukrainian identity and counter what he calls Russian propaganda. This is not as alarming as Putin wanting to take back Alaska. But it's a different sort of land grab. Over time, the revived ethnic Ukrainians may want to secede from Russia and perhaps join Ukraine someday. Of course, there's no real way for Zelensky to enforce this decree. It's a stunt to drive wedges into Russia's social fabric. But it proves that the rift between Russians and Ukrainians is growing and the wounds may last for years to come. Our next story is from the Philippines. The country has defied the ICC once again. That's the International Criminal Court. President Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos Jr. made a statement today. He said the Philippines will not lift a finger to assist the ICC. Those were his words. This is in their probe into the country's war on drugs. 
Thousands have been killed in the Philippines under this drug war. Vigilante death squads used to roam the streets. They assassinated people in broad daylight. Many were criminals, but many were innocent civilians as well. The death squad culture was blamed on the country's former president, Rodrigo Duterte. He's the one that the ICC is ultimately investigating, but his allies say that the ICC has no right to go after him. That they, and they keep defying the institution, which keeps looking more and more irrelevant. Here's our report. The International Criminal Court. It was formed in 2002 to prosecute individuals for the worst international crimes. Genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes. It has international jurisdiction to go after the worst of the worst, making it a shining light fighting against everything wrong in the world. At least that was the sales pitch. The reality is very different. The ICC is a paper tiger. The Hague-based court is dependent on the cooperation of national governments. If a country doesn't cooperate, the ICC doesn't work. Take the Philippines, for example. The ICC is looking into the country's war on drugs, a heroic-sounding name for a brutal period of extrajudicial killings. The Philippines had a drug problem, and the government's solution was apparently to kill everyone in sight. This was under the previous president, Rodrigo Duterte. Before becoming president, Duterte was a mayor of the city of Davao. He ruled the city for almost two decades and made Davao famous for the DDS, the Davao Death Squad. They killed drug dealers, street children, and anyone allegedly involved in criminal activities. They allegedly had the support of the police and of the city's elected officials, like Duterte. Over the years, Davao got the reputation of being a safe city, except for all the daylight murders, of course. And Duterte used this to win the presidency in 2016. He promised to replicate the Davao model all over the Philippines. And what followed was a bloodbath. The official death toll is about 6,200. Unofficially, it crossed 27,000. And we don't know how many of the victims were even related to drugs and how many were collateral damage. The Philippines was under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court till 2019. So the court began investigating. This was in 2016, when Duterte had just become president. Obviously, Duterte stalled it. He even stopped the country from being party to the ICC in 2019. But the court persisted. It said it would still investigate all the drug war crimes between 2011 and 2019. But it won't have any help from the country. The current president, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., is allied with Duterte. Their political parties are in the same coalition. Duterte's daughter is Marcos Jr.'s vice president, so of course he won't help put the former president in jail. The politicians are calling the ICC a threat to national sovereignty. They say it undermines the country's criminal justice system. The ICC is unlikely to achieve any success in the Duterte case, adding to a long list of the court's failures. It can't investigate countries that were never party to it, not even countries with a history of war crimes like the US. The ICC constantly tries to bite off more than it can chew, like by putting out an arrest warrant for Russian President Vladimir Putin. The ICC needs serious reform. It needs to be given teeth and a proper international mandate. If not, every nation it inconveniences will just keep showing it the door. Growing up in a big family can be amazing, but it comes with perils. Like race for the last slice of pizza, struggle to grab the TV remote and a barrage of hand-me-downs. Where worn clothes are passed passed down from older to younger siblings. And personal taste goes for a toss. Maybe that's why second-hand clothes got a bad name. Or maybe it was the resale shops of the olden days. They were a rummage fest and screamed poor quality and poor hygiene. Thankfully, second-hand fashion has come a long way since. It has moved from fringes of the society to the mainstream and has picked up quirky names along the way, like thrifted, upcycled or pre-loved clothing. Call them what you want, but pre-loved clothes are having their moment. The global 
clothing market, clothing resale market is worth $193 billion. It's expected to hit $350 billion by 2027. There are two main reasons behind this boom. One is the cost of living crisis. Buying used clothes, shoes or bags is a frugal choice and many times a smart one. Which brings me to the second reason, sustainability. 80 billion pieces of new clothing are purchased every year the world over, 80 billion. But every three in five of these items end up in landfills within years. So pre-loved clothes can save money, reduce carbon footprints, and in doing so, grab the attention of the usually attention deficit Gen Z. The young are largely driving the shift. They form 31% of the consumer base for resold fashion, also 90% of the user base for some online fashion reselling stores. Hashtag vintage has about 30 billion views on TikTok, the young generation's favorite app, 30 billion. This doesn't mean older generations are not interested. Just look at children's wear. It's the fastest growing apparel resale category meaning parents are interested too. So upcycled fashion has become big business, but buying pre-loved is only one part of the story. Selling it is the flip side. Consumers now declutter their wardrobes, sell items they no longer wear and make a quick buck. This is especially true for, and you guessed it, Gen Z. They make 44% of those reselling apparel and the process has become easier with time. There are online portals to resell items. In the UK, eBay saw a 20% annual rise in 2023 for secondhand fashion listings. There are thrift stores on Instagram too. They have become a big deal in India. People source items, clean them, style them for a photo shoot, market, package, then sell. And that's not all. You see, a circular economy is in process. So mainstream retailers want a slice. Clothing giant H&M has a resale service. Selfridges, an upscale British department store, has a vintage channel. Asda too has a successful second-hand clothing division. The high-end fashion market is being redefined as well. Luxury handbags, shoes or watches have become an asset. Their price usually increases with time, so people simply resell these products after use and get more than their money's worth. 62% of resellers reportedly get more than they spent. And our major brands want in as well. Balenciaga has a resell program across America, Europe and Singapore. Owners can sell their pre-owned products to the brand and get paid for it. Luxury bag maker Coach has a resell program too. Watch brand Rolex offers pre-loved watches in Europe. Meanwhile, Kering the parent company of Gucci invested $193 million in a pre-loved e-tailer brand in 2022. Its transaction volume grew over 100% by 2023. So upcycle pieces are not only cheaper and more sustainable, they're changing the game of fashion. You see, to some, thrifting is a fad, to others, a passion, and to many, the affordable choice now. But no matter the reason, the world seems to be loving pre-loved. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In China, houses shake as a 7.1 quake hits the Kyrgyzstan-Xinjiang border. In Portugal, the world's best big wave, big wave surfers, dodge crashes for the top honors. And a paraplegic adventurer is skiing across the South Pole for spinal injury cure. Finally, we're taking you back in history on this day in 1950, Israel pro proclaimed Jerusalem as its capital. All branches of the Israeli government are located in Jerusalem. The city is also claimed by Palestinians as the capital of their future state. Most of the world does not recognize Israel's claim. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.